Hey, welcome back to the About the Labor podcast here at VikingsTerritory.com. I am BJ Rydell, back here with my guy, Drew Mahold. And today, uh, we have another uh, Teddy and Case Keenum update. Um, if you just woke up, perhaps, uh, Teddy Bridgewater will be sitting this week, and Case Keenum will have his uh, starting tenure extended for at least one more week, potentially even two with a short week against Detroit next week. So, um, we got updated on that news. We'll react to that a little bit. Um, talk a little bit about Greg Olson being in the booth for the Vikings this week and Rick Spielman's um, reaction to a player on IR of on a team of, for an upcoming opponent and kind of how that plays into everything. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, finish up with some Twitter takes and anything else we can come up with here. So that's the plan for the show today. Um, Start off here with a word from our sponsors at SOCOM Creative. Is your website ugly? It's time for an upgrade. It's almost 2018. If your website doesn't look good on a smartphone, you are losing money. That's just how it is. It's time to call an audible. Take your business to the next level with a professional quality website or mobile app. Thank us later. The world is changing. It's time to score touchdowns. Stop missing field goals. If you want your business to grow online, you need a web, social media, and mobile presence to get that job done. SOCOM Creative, they build apps, websites, and create winning strategies. Check them out at www.socomcreative.co. All right, so let's hop right into this Teddy and uh, Case uh, situation. Um, As we kind of all expected, Case Keenum has been officially named the starter per everyone on the planet. Um, Mike Zimmer announced it during his press conference this morning with the local media. Uh, He is going to be the starter on Sunday against the uh, the Los Angeles Rams. That means he likely will also be the starter against the Detroit Lions. Um, I guess what's your, you know, let me reiterate this. I think this was the expected move. I think a lot of us uh, kind of saw this coming based off of the, you know, the information that was provided by Zimmer earlier this week. Um, So this doesn't really come as a shock to me. I don't think it should come Mm -hmm. as a shock to anyone. Uh, But what's your reaction to this? Are you cool with Case Keenum riding it out here and Teddy Bridgewater continuing to sit? Oh, I mean, mean, yeah, I'm cool with it. Uh, I think that's a problem. But, um, you know, I obviously, I mean, the way I've expressed my feelings on this, I would have rather seen the Vikings take a shot shot here um, and see what Teddy has. And I think that benefits both the short-term and the long-term for the team. You know, A, with this year, I think you – you know, you can see you don't have that like what if factor with Teddy, right? If the Vikings do make a playoff run um, and they don't ever have, you know, if Teddy never enters the game and they end up losing early in the playoffs, you never know really how much higher Teddy could have taken this team. And I always right. kind of think, you know, you got to take your chance there. Um, and long term, too, you, you, for 2018, you know what you have in Teddy Bridgewater, you know how much value he has. And if you want to bring him back in the next year or not, because Vikings have essentially no quarterbacks on on contract for next year. So they have to make a move somewhere or another and you have to find out really what you have in Teddy Bridgewater, I think. So, um, I think it benefits both ways, but I understand completely writing the hot hand here. Case Keenum obviously has played, uh, very well given the circumstances here kind of coming in, um, and, you know, taking over for an offense, leading an offense that, you know, it's obviously a huge upgrade around for, you know, in considering the pieces around him. Um, so, I mean, I think he's, he's in a very good situation and, I mean, they've been winning five straight games. Um, there's really, I understand that, um, you know, you don't want to stop a winning streak by any means. So there's very good arguments for both sides. Um, and I understand Zimmer going with Keenum here. Yeah, it certainly makes sense to stick with Case Keenum here. I feel like, you know, we've been using all these gambling an- analogies with Teddy Bridgewater, and it seems like Mike Zimmer just simply didn't want to gamble here. I mean, that's exactly what that type of situation would be, right? Um, if you're feeling comfortable with Case Keenum right now, switching that up is going to be a gamble, no matter how you look at it. You know, I'm with you in feeling that the Vikings should invest in that gamble simply because you think that Teddy Bridgewater is going to be your franchise quarterback. That's what we always thought he would be when he was drafted in the first round. Um, you want to see what he looks like coming off of injury. I get all that, uh, but it's still a gamble because you never really know what type of impact a quarterback change can have because the quarterback position influences so many other players. I mean, think about this. Uh, if Teddy Bridgewater comes in, this is a guy that hasn't played with most of these guys since 2015, if ever at all. So, you know, what's the chemistry look like with Adam Thielen downfield? He's been great mm-hmm. with Case Keenum. What's it look like with Stephon Diggs? Those Teddy Bridgewater and Diggs were electric initially, uh, but he's worked very well with Case Keenum this year as well. So, you know, Kyle Rudolph, another guy that has been getting involved lately. Um, does that, does any of this, you know, 
I think we've expressed that it, the mental fortitude of both Bridgewater and Keenum is strong enough to withstand, you know, the sw the, the flip-ins, this whole situation pretty much. Um, but is the chemistry between quarterback and receiver, you know, how in, how there's no way to quantify how much that will right. influence them. So to some extent, you're making the safe play here. I don't hate it. I'm cool with Case. I think that Case has been phenomenal most of the time, I guess. Um, but, you know, he, Zimmer said in his pre press conference earlier this week, uh, those were two really dumb interceptions that if you're playing in the postseason and you've got a two-score lead with an opportunity to take a three-score right. lead, that absolutely can't happen. And I'm not saying Case Keenum doesn't know that. I mean, I'm sure he was upset, more upset than anyone about those two picks. But... Those two things, like those turnovers late in games with the lead, absolutely can't happen. And if that's not going to happen anymore, let's say Case figures this out and, you know, keeps his interceptions to the first quarter, something like that. I don't know. Um, or none. How about or, none? How about none? Yeah, there, there's also that. Um, but the point being here is that, you know, it's a gamble with Teddy Bridgewater. I understand the move. Um, you know, end of the day, Mike Zimmer wants the Vikings to win. This is the move that he believes will help the Vikings win, um, not just this week against the Rams, but next week against Detroit as well. So um, good for Case, and I think this ultimately is probably a good thing for the Vikings too. Right, and so now the next question I have is, um, does this impact um, to you the, the chances that Teddy starts at all this year? Uh, because I look at this and I say – you, know, you can't you can't plug in Teddy in a short week next week unless something goes drastically right. you know horrible with Case this week. Yep. Um, so I would I would assume Case is essentially named the starter for the Lions game, yep. um, and then you know if the Vikings end up winning both of those games, which is very realistic, they're nine and two at seven straight wins. Mm -hmm. Then it comes it becomes very difficult to make that switch. It means even more difficult because you have you know fewer time to get together. You have um, it just there's a narrow, more narrow window for that change to happen and to have that opportunity to take that risk. So um, I feel like this is essentially naming Case Keenum the starter the rest of the season. Um, just looking at the chances of anything else happening, um, that's kind of the way I see this right now. Is that Case Keenum will probably be the starting quarterback the rest of the season, and that you know it would take something pretty bad as far as probably Keenum's performance or an injury. Um, you know, for Bridgewater to get that chance at the starting uh, at the starting position this year. Um, you know, I think that's possible. I, I think that it's very. You know, I think you could be very, you know, right here in saying that Case Keenum has officially been named the starter. Uh, that hasn't act actually been said just yet. So right, yeah. You know, I understand that. I'm saying here. Here's my thought. Here is that the Vikings essentially play ten games, or excuse me, two games in ten days. Um, it's going. It's a very, very important two-game stretch. You can make the argument that this game against the Rams this week is, you know, going to determine if the Vikings have home field advantage in the playoffs. Um, if they get a bye, that type of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of implications on this game, and then obviously against Detroit next week, playing a division game on Thanksgiving, um, an opportunity to split that tiebreaker um, in the head-to-head -head matchup. Um, you know, distance yourselves even further. Um, I think this is, you know, for Case Keenum. I think this is, you know. Instead, he's been playing to get to this opportunity, and now he has the opportunity to reinforce the fact that he is the team starter. He came out earlier this week and he said, "In my head, I believe I'm the team starter." Now, I think that the team, the the team, as in you know the Vikings management, that is Zimmer, Shermer, Spielman, whoever's involved in this decision making, I think that they have start started to buy into that a little bit, rightfully so. And I think they're going to give him this 10-day stretch of two very important games to prove that he can be the franchise guy. And if he comes out here with, let's say he goes two, let's say he goes one and one, beats Detroit, loses against the Rams this week, um, and looks good in both games, gives the team an opportunity to win. I think that you could very well see him being the starter for the rest of the season. Now, if he st if he goes 0 and two and we see erratic case, key, right, right, right gets picked off a couple of times then you on that it kind of that half bye week after the Detroit game that's where I see you could put Teddy in if that is the case no pun intended right and I think I think that the importance of the Detroit game kind of you know I I would be shocked if the Vikings made a change at all just right. on a short week right and the fact that again I keep saying this over and over but the Lions are not out of the NFC North race by any stretch of the imagination given their schedule the rest of the year and given that they do have the tiebreak over the Vikings right now and if they win that game um, at least at this point, um, this is before week 11, but at this point, they would close that gap to one game between the two um, coming down the stretch. So um, that's such a huge gain that I really can't imagine 
Zimmer making a change there um, on, on, the, on a short week. But, you know, it, it's possible the rest of the way that Zimmer or that Bridgewater gets to start somewhere. Um, but I just I don't see it right now. Um, I, I, I really think I mean, obviously, I think week 10 was the best t- time to do this. Yeah. But I, th- I had to have been earlier than, than later to, to really make this thing, you know, make sense. You have you have a good. Um, sample for Teddy, a decent sample for Teddy. Um, and then you have your sample for Case, and you can work off of that down the stretch when games start to really matter. Yeah, so, it, you know, I, I'm with you. I think that this probably means that Case Keenum is the, um, I guess, short-term option for sure, meaning short-term, you know, the next two weeks for sure, possibly even longer. Um, I think that the, the for the Teddy Bridgewater apologists out there, I think that you're – you know, the likelihood of him starting now just took a big hit for sure. Uh, Case Keenum has played well enough to earn this position. He has played well enough to keep Teddy Bridgewater on the sideline. And at the end of the day, yes, we all want to see Teddy Bridgewater, but um, Case Keenum probably does give this team the best opportunity to win these next two games for sure Mm -hmm. because he's the most prepared Uh, he's been playing in the system he's on a winning streak we all know that guys Um, he he is the this he is the most prepared maybe not the most talented but the most prepared quarterback to handle these two very important games you can't blame Zimmer for this decision Uh, you know I think we are going to see Teddy Bridgewater at some point I don't know what capacity that's going to be but he's eventually going to get back on the field um you know, it's going to happen for Teddy Bridgewater eventually. But right now I think that, you know, this is Case Keenum's time to shine. Uh, This is an opportunity to set the tone for both his career and this team moving forward. Two very important games. You can't blame the move. Even if you don't like it, you have to understand it, in my opinion. Um, Case Keenum is going to be the guy. It's time for everyone to accept that and get behind this dude because – um, let's be real here. For three quarters of last week, he was exceptional against a very good, um, you know, a very good team, a playoff caliber team, a very good secondary. I mean, I know Diggs and Thielen were making Josh Norman look like a joke out there, but Case Keenum was also laying it in there for him to catch it too. So, you know, overall, you can see both stand both sides here, um, but at the end of the day, the safer choice is Case Keenum. I think the Vikings are probably making the right move here. Yeah, I mean. I don't think I still don't think it's the right move. I mean, there's not really I guess there's not really a wrong move here, right? I think I don't think either one's wrong. I just think there's one that's might that might be more right than one and the yeah. other one. And I think that's the case here. Um, no pun intended again. Are we, are we going to keep saying no pun intended every time I, we say I do, I do the every case single time. or yeah. okay. So, just yeah. Okay. Just, I think we should move on because I think <laughs> I'm getting tired of this conversation already and uh, you know, Fair it, it's I will say that this is more complex. The case Teddy thing is more complex than any Sam Bradford versus Teddy Bridgewater uh, debate was or would have been um, if Bradford was healthy um, at any point, even if it was meant, you know, next off season, if it meant whatever, um, right. this is way more complex and it's, you know, it took case Keenum of all players leading a five game winning streak. Um, even, even ba- to barely, barely keep his job, which is, I think that shows the, the faith the team has in Teddy Bridgewater um, it also says how well the case is played as well. Absolutely. All right, so let's move on to this Greg Olson debacle. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Greg Olson, um, he is a tight end, a very good tight end for the Carolina Panthers. Um, he is widely regarded across the league as, you know, maybe a top three tight end, um, maybe the most important player in his offense other than Cam Newton. Uh, critical player that was injured early on this year. He's on injured reserve. Um, he has the potential to return later on the season, I read, but it's not necessarily likely. The Vikings play the Carolina Panthers in a couple weeks here in what is going to be another very important NFC matchup uh, for positioning in the postseason. And Greg Olson is going to be in the booth this weekend, um, basically you know, adding extra analysis to uh, the broadcast. So he's going to be sitting in the booth watching the Vikings game. He's going to have access to the Vikings personnel before the game in order to you know, prep for the game itself in order to offer commentary and, you know, anecdotes and that type of stuff. Uh, Rick Spielman did not like this at all, and I do not blame him. Rick Spielman came out and said this is, you know, unacceptable that, you know, he can basically go out, you know, Greg Olson can take the information that he learned from the Vikings, which I'm sure the Vikings are going to be very, you know, uh, I would expect this broadcast to feature less 
information than usual because I think the Vikings will be very careful with with, with what Greg Olson is given. Um, and basically said that this is just this is unprofessional. Uh, you can't have that out there if the Vikings are trying to win a game down the road against Carolina. Um, well, so what's your take on Rick Spielman here? Does he have a real like? Do you believe he has a realistic gripe here, or um, is this just kind of you know him exercising his power as a general manager? Um, I think he has a right to be you know skeptical of the whole thing, um, and I really don't see why Fox can't just move Greg Olson to a different game right, right. in which the Panthers play a team or there's a team in which the Panthers don't play you know the rest of the season, but um, or just not, not have him in the booth at all. Right. I mean, but I'm not too upset or you know concerned about anything just because I feel like. Um, I don't think the broadcasting team gets inside information that most fans don't know anyway. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but like, I mean, they get to talk to the coaches and I'm not the, the coaches don't, you know, aren't telling them their exact scheme and their, right. their you know, their schedule of the plays are going to run that type of thing. Um, they don't, they don't say things to the broadcasting team that they don't say in most press conferences. Um, and I feel like as, as a player, Greg Olson's going to watch this game anyway. Right. And, even with with the all twenty two angle and everything yeah. like that, so I don't know. I mean, I, I see both sides, um, but you know, I, I I I just part of the one side of me is like, why can't Fox just move Greg Olson to a different game? Yeah. What 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 does it matter? And then the next part is, well, I don't think I really don't think Greg Olson's going to learn much yeah. more, if at all, doing this broadcast than he would just by preparing for the game like normal. Yeah, I I agree with you on both of your takes here. So here here is why it doesn't matter to me and why I think you know you could make a case for Spielman being a bit of a baby here so NFL teams literally hire personnel to go on other teams websites likely their upcoming opponents and watch their press conference to see if guys slip up if they say something stupid they alert you know Mike Zimmer and say hey Robert Woods came out and said Xavier Rhodes sucks make sure you let Xavier Rhodes know that because that's what he said today in this press conference obviously I'm using a fake story here that's completely fictional Robert Woods did not say that but that's what people are literally paid to do so Greg Olson in theory has access to all this information anyways anything the Vikings make public he can find out whether he's sitting in the booth or he's sitting on his couch so in that sense, yeah, it doesn't really matter, and it's cool to have Greg Olson in the booth. Um, for those of you who are familiar with him, I think he's an awesome personality, very funny dude, very smart player. I'm sure he will offer a perspective that none of us could even try to do, um, especially being a current player. So I think it's a very cool idea, just like you said, possibly not executed properly with the Vikings playing Carolina down the road. Um, yeah. And what will be a very important game. Yeah, exactly. So you understand why Spielman is kind of pissed about this, uh, but you also can see why Fox is just like, yo, Rick, chill. Like, it's not that big of a deal. You're not – just don't tell Greg anything you don't want him to know, you know? Like, it. I understand – the one thing I will say here is that I do think it is unprofessional, which is the term that Rick Spielman used. I do think this is an unprofessional maneuver by Fox to kind of put Spielman in this type of situation when he's the one making them money, essentially. Uh, so that's my one uh, kind of thing that bothers me about the situation is just that I do think it's unprofessional by Fox. At the same time, it's not, it wouldn't, probably wouldn't be the first time they've done something unprofessional. So... I don't really care. I just think this is a fun talker because this is a weird scenario that, I mean, when was the last time you heard this type of thing happen? Maybe, is yeah. this, maybe this is, the first it, time. It's ever? really weird. Has a, has an active player done this on bye week? I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't, I can't think of another time, but um, I find this whole compromise they made a little weird because the initial plan was to have Greg Olson literally participate in every part of the production planning with the team. I mean, they'd be going to both teams and talking right. to coaches and the right. players and uh, all of that. And they, and then they eventually compromised to, um, well, he's not going to go to the production meetings. He's not going to talk to the players. He's just going to kind of basically show up in the booth, yeah. um, you know, on game day and it's get ready there. a pretty good gig for him. But right. But at the same time, like I, I can't imagine that if he asks Charles Davis and Kevin Burkhart, I think that's who it's going to be. Um, if he yeah. asks them, a question about something that the Vikings said. I'm not, I can't imagine that they would say, no, I'm not going to tell you that <laughs> when it would only help our, the, the success of our broadcast and the quality of our broadcast. Um, if you knew this information. So 
I really don't buy that compromise that was that was made. Um, I, I I think Greg Olson's going if he wanted to, he could learn all the information that you know the, the two main guys would learn anyway. So I don't know. I I it, I don't know. I'm not that. It's not a big deal to me, but I understand how it could be, and I understand why people are worried. But again, Fox man, why why can't just why can't you just move into a different game? Right. I mean, I, what, what's what's the what's the problem with that? Yeah, that's that's the real question here, and really the only thing that's you know odd. I will say that I am excited about you know Greg Olson being out there just because I do like him. I hope he go, gets up there and does uh, some of that seventh floor gang stuff for Miami and drops a third leg Greg rap on us uh, mid broadcast. <laughs> I'd absolutely lose my mind. Uh, so I am excited about this, and I do think this is a cool idea because. I really like players' analysis, or excuse me, analysis from players who are j- like just left the league. A lot, of, like Tony Romo, for example. I got, I have to believe that the reason why Fox is doing this is because of the perspective that Tony Romo is offering on CBS. Yeah, sure, it's it's the ultimate. Co- I mean, it's the ultimate comeback. You try to there there. CBS is getting this unbelievable firsthand analysis from Tony Romo because he was literally on a field for a team last year, which is awesome. And, you know. Perfect money maker for CBS and for Tony Romo. Now Fox responds by saying, "All right, you got a player who just retired. I'm going to take a guy who is still playing, but he's hurt right now." That's the response. That's why this happened, and you get the pers- like you understand why that's the like why that might work, but you also understand why Rick Spielman would be pissed. That's kind of what it comes down to for me. I'm excited to see what happens here just because I think it's a cool experiment. I wish that you know Fox would move the game like Drew said, and I wish that maybe. Rick Spielman would tone it down a little bit because I don't think it's you know enough of a reason to get his veins popping out on his arms. But you know, who really cares? I don't. I mean, if the Vikings win against Carolina against the Rams, we're not going to even remember that this happened. So there's that. Um, let's move on here to let's do some let's do some of the coverage charts since we do have some extra time sure. here, um, and then we'll get into Twitter. Um, you know. For those of you guys who are maybe new to the podcast, I do the coverage chart every single week. It's always on vikingsterritory.com. It's on the featured section. Uh, there's an entire database there. I update it every single week. Um, so th- this past week, in my opinion, was one of the Vikings' worst performances. Uh, obviously, against Washington, you guys are you know not, probably aren't too surprised by this, given that the Kirk Cousins ended up throwing for 327 yards. Only one touchdown, though. Um, and so over their last six games, the Vikings have actually only allowed four touchdowns through the air. That's very nice to see. Um, the cumulative stats still look great. Um, a couple of things that I want to note on this Washington depth, ch- uh, on this Washington coverage chart here. Uh, tr- uh, first of all, Xavier Rhodes maintains barely, and I mean barely, maintains his no-touchdown streak. That was my bold prediction on the Vikings territory roundtable. Uh, Josh Doxson should have had a touchdown against him, but instead, uh, three targets, two receptions, 11 yards allowed for him, 72.92 quarterback rating. Trey Waynes, in my opinion, played an outstanding game. You take away that circus catch from Maurice Harris, I believe that was, what, like 30-something yards? Uh, And all all of a sudden, his day is three targets, one reception, roughly 15 yards allowed, and no touchdowns if you take away that circus catch. So overall, I thought he played very well. Linebackers struggled quite a bit. Anthony Barr mm. and Eric Kendricks <clears throat> allowed a total of 137 yards um, on 17 targets, so that's not great. But overall, you saw great games from Wayne, Sandejo, Rhodes. Basically, the linebackers were really the only scapegoats here. Um, what are you seeing? Any uh, Anything that I'm missing here? I think we need to give credit to Andrew Sandejo um, because I believe all three of the targets where he you know, I was um, accounted for were all plays in which he – um, the player receiver caught the ball or at least had possession of the ball at one point and Sandejo got his hand in there to knock it out. I believe that happened three times. Yeah. Um, so th- I think we need to give Sandejo some credit for that because that's not an easy thing to do and to track the ball and to, to you know, obviously stick with it, but also to track it and uh, knock it out of the receiver's hands. Um, so he don't he didn't allow any catches, any yards this week. I think Pro Football Focus gave him a ton of credit. Um, I think he deserves some respect for the way he has um, quietly – kind of under the radar but um you know he has improved uh significantly over the past couple of years so um there's that and then i think um mckenzie alexander as well on his yeah. birthday tremendous game he had the interception he had um you know he only allowed two completions the, on uh, the, six targets so. and it was the one big one that actually that really hurt his numbers right 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 the, uh, the, the crowder one jameson yep, crowder the, beat him up the same. 
Yeah. yeah. That was the so, one play that he didn't look good on. The rest of them, fantastic across the board for Mackenzie Alexander. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I, 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 you know, and we were worried about Chris Thompson and, um, yep. you know, some of the tight, like Vernon Davis, a tight end with these linebackers a little bit this week. But um, I have a fee. I mean, Todd Gurley's a really good receiving back, but at the tight end, I think it's Tyler Higby for the Rams moving forward this week. Not as big of a threat to me as, you know, Washington's Vernon Davis. Um, so it'll be a lot of tests as far as the backfield goes. But, um, you know, I, I do expect a bounce back game uh, to some degree from, from barring Kendricks this week. Yeah, I think that, you know, Kendricks did not look great most of the game. I thought he came up and made a couple of really nice tackles, but he got beaten kind of by soft zones. He got stuck in in the middle um, where, you know, there's a couple of different times where if the safety had came up a little bit more or he had dropped back a little bit more, completions probably wouldn't have happened. Um, but that's just a situation where, you know, you pick your poison and you try to drop a touch throw in there and sometimes it's going to work. And it, with, against a good quarterback like Kirk Cousins, I mean – He's going to get his to some degree. We say this about all good players. Kirk Cousins, you might not think he's that great of a player, but he has been fairly consistent throughout his career. I think he deserves, you know, some credit uh, for the, you know, the accomplishments that he has throughout his career. Um, and to some degree, that probably influenced the inflated stats by the linebackers. Drew mentioned the fact that Vernon Davis and Chris Thompson, uh, we were worried about them, and they came out and they kind of did their thing a little bit. You have to wonder if Jordan Reed was in there, if it would have been any worse, if this game would have been possibly yeah. a little bit different maybe. Uh, but the Vikings do come out with the win. Um, you see, you've seen consistent production from a couple of guys that you know maybe you didn't believe all that much in, in Mackenzie Alexander and Andrew Sandejo, like Drew said. Uh, that's phenomenal in itself to see those guys playing so well. You know, Mackenzie Alexander, tough rookie year last year. Uh, didn't, you know, I guess he didn't live up to that second round hype last year. We weren't, you know, we were all concerned about him replacing Captain Munderland. He comes in, ha shows, you know, the type of coverage skills that we saw at Clemson plus one. I don't think he had an interception in college, so. I don't think um, he did either. So that it's good to see, you know, no hands Mackenzie Alexander get his hands on a pick there. That's always great to see. And like you said with Andrew Sadeo, I mean, there's two pass breakups in the that like basically uh, two pass breakups he had basically decided this game. You know, he knocked a ball out of Jameson Crowder's hands in the end zone, and he knocked another one downfield that could have either resulted in a touchdown or been a touchdown on the same play. So Sadeo is phenomenal. Uh, I want to talk about Harrison Smith because I think this was his first bad game of the year at least from a coverage standpoint he was flying around as usual uh, making big tackles and whatnot in run defense but three targets two receptions allowed 39 yards that's a bad game for Harrison Smith seriously like that is one of the worst I think that's the most yards he's allowed this year that's you know just think about that 39 yards on three targets that's the worst case scenario with Harrison Smith this season so uh, it just goes to show, you know, how impressive he has been all season long, and kind of wh what type of bar he has set moving forward. Yeah, um, I'm trying to look back at all these games right now, and he has had one other game this year in which he allowed a pass rating over 100, and it was because of that Juju Smith-Schuster touchdown week two against Pittsburgh, where yep. I mean, by default he was assigned to that guy, but it was really a designed run play in which you know there's a forward forward pitch to Schuster, so. Um, I mean, overall for the season, his passer rating is actually worse than a quarterback throwing an incomplete, incomplete pass every single right. uh, throw. I mean, spiking into the ground every time is 39.6 passer rating. His passer rating allowed uh, is 31.53. So, you know, uh, this is a um, a mild step back for Harrison Smith, and he's still the, elite in the, coverage and elite at run defense and elite in very virtually every aspect of playing the safety position. Right. So I'm not I'm not exactly worried about this game by any means. Right. There's no there's no reason to believe that he won't, you know, be his normal self next week against the Rams. And even if he isn't his normal self, you know, still an all pro caliber player even when he's a little bit off in coverage. Uh no reason to to believe that he won't, you know, get back to his you know, normal self next week, just pointing it out that was arguably the worst game of Harrison Smith's career, and you probably, or excuse me, not career, season, um, and you probably barely even noticed that. So that's how good Harrison Smith has been all season long. So uh, from there, let's jump into some Twitter takes because I think we do have quite a few of them um, with the Case Keenum, Teddy Bridgewater news. I'm not shocked by that. Uh, so let's jump into that, and then we'll finish off here with our the, uh, the announcement for the T-shirt giveaway, yep. and uh, that'll be it. All right, um, let's see if we'll go back to beginning here. Um, we got 
our buddy Eli at Skull Seas gave us a, both a QB take and then a, a take for the Rams game this weekend. So um, he said for QB, stay, saying we stay with Keenum until we lose is a losing mentality because it is conceding a loss at some point, which I haven't actually thought about it that way. But then uh, for as far as Sunday's game, um, the Rams run a ton of screens. Um, so a tight man defense and fewer blitzes should be central to the game plan. Um, how do you feel about both of those? All right, so let's start with the quarterback take here. Um, yeah, I mean, to some degree, yes. But th- my response to that, and this is the first thing that popped into my head here, is that people who support Teddy Bridgewater are also conceding a loss to some degree because they're saying, basically, start Teddy no matter what. If he sucks the first game, he's going to have to shake the rust off. So you can make an That's argument true. both ways um, using that similar kind of, uh, you know, I guess, outline uh, for both sides there. Um uh, I don't think that you should ever have a losing mentality. <laughs> I don't know why people I, – I saw a poll earlier today. Um, I believe it was Skull Bros that tweeted it out. Yeah, it I was, remember this too. It was kind of a screwed up – like it was written in a way that was not exactly Well, fair. no, okay. I think I remember the, the poll was – I think the poll simply said like, you know, what would you rather have, Teddy start or Vikings win? Right. But I think, I think what it, it – you know, it, to clarify it, I would say that it meant would you rather have – the Vikings win a guaranteed this week. Yeah. Or would you rather have Teddy starting with the possibility of a loss? Right. Right. And, and everyone, uh, you know, most people, I think it was like 80% of people said they'd rather have the Vikings win. That's the rational take here. I mean, at the but end of the day, sense that they'd rather have Teddy start with the possibility right. of a loss. Which so is that's concerning. That's concerning in my opinion about this fan base, but you know, it is what it is. You're all entitled to your own opinion, and I, I want to support that. So on to Eli's next point here about this take for the game. Uh, Rams, Rams run a ton of screens, tight man D, fewer blitzes should be central to the game plan. Uh, hard to disagree with what he's arguing here. Um, I haven't do, you know gone too deep into the Rams film yet because we typically talk about you know the opponent on the next show, on Friday's show. Uh, but from what I know about the Rams, from what I know about Jared Goff, from what I know about Sean McVay, uh, let me just reiterate this. I think I said this on like six shows already. I love Sean McVay. I think he's phenomenal. Um, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, the best way to beat the Rams is to create as many individual matchups as you can and then make sure that you're doubling guys like Aaron Donald on uh, from an offensive perspective. Uh but on you know for on defense, I think if you man up across the board, I like Xavier Rhodes against you know was it going to be Sammy Watkins or Robert Woods, one of those two. Yeah. I like Trey Waynes against whoever else is there. I like Anthony Barr against Tyler Higby or whoever they tossed out there at tight end. I think the man to man matchups favor the Vikings. So if you can create some nice disguises, as Mike Zimmer has shown an ability to do, um, I think this is definitely a good idea here. Um, tightening up, effective tackling. You know, aggressively disciplined. You know, you know our key phrases here. I, I believe yeah. this is you know a good take and a definitely a good uh, you know a good outline for success against the Rams this week. Um, next one here. Do we want to touch about you know, touch on Sam Newman's tweet about Taylor Heineke, or should we just pass on that one? Yeah, we might as well touch on that. I we'll, guess we'll, we'll touch on it. That you said. Uh, so he's the, the tweet is: Do you feel your prediction that Heineke would beat out Keenum in training camp is turning into your worst take ever? Yes. Yes. Okay. Simply. I am. I. I, I am. In, this is why I want to touch on this because I still don't think like. Okay, it hasn't. A the take has not aged well. That's that's definitive at this point. I can't deny it. I've already expressed my apologies to Case Keenan for doubting him, um, and I've always I already expressed I believe that he has played very you know very well so far. Very happy with his production. Happy with him being the starting quarterback, but I still don't think believing in Taylor Heineke to a degree and based off of what we saw from Case Keenum in the past, not this Case Keenum was that poor of a take. It just, it's wrong for sure, but, and it's looking like my worst take of all time, but I don't think it's that bad just because, I mean, look at all the teams that have looked at Taylor Heineke since then. We got the Patriots, the Bears, I think the Panthers were mixed in there as well. You know, there have been a lot of teams that have seen something from Heineke that I saw as well. Obviously, what I missed here, and this is the critical point here, the one that you guys all want me to say, I missed on the fact that Case Keenum is a better quarterback right now than Taylor Heineke, and he should have been the backup quarterback from the start. So, yes, that was a poor take by me. I own it. I'm okay with it. I still love Taylor Heineke. Period. All right, I, I have nothing to say other than that I was correct about this. Um, <laughs> the next one from at Don from Ohio. Uh, if Rhodes has to shadow one receiver this weekend – 
um, you know, for the Rams, who would it be? Well, you look at the – I mean, there's two guys, in my opinion, that – you know, it comes down to two guys, right? Sammy Watkins and Robert Woods. Those are your two – Leading candidates here, I think you could probably make a case, no pun intended, for someone else if you wanted to. Uh, but those are probably the best two picks here. From what I have seen, Robert Woods has been the guy who has commanded the most targets. He has had the most expanded route tree. He's been asked to do the most things. So, you know, based off of those things right there, I think Robert Woods is probably your guy. Now, who do I think is the better receiver here? Definitely Sammy Watkins. I, you know, I went to bat for this guy as soon as they traded for him. Um, I think that he was a phenomenal ad. I just don't think that he has been used, you know, in a variety of different ways yet. Um, for the most part, he's seeing his targets on nine routes and, you know, seven and eights or, you know, double moves, stuff like that downfield. Um, that's something that Trey Waynes could probably cover pretty well based off of his skill set. So I think that Watkins is the better receiver here. And if he was more immersed in that offense to this point, I think that he's probably the guy. But because Robert Woods has been the guy, I think you at least start the game with road shadowing Woods across the field. See, I'm going to pick Watkins here uh, just because I feel like Watkins has the best and most sheer talent, um, size, physicality, ability. I think he's got the edge over Woods here. Um, he's just kind of had a, a rough, not rough, but a um, kind of less than expected start to his career due to injuries and whatnot. Uh, so I'm going to pick Watkins in this scenario. Uh, but again, I think they're, they're, they're on an even enough playing field where it won't matter too much. And I don't even think he'll shadow a receiver. I think he'll just stay to one side of the field. It's one of those where there's not one guy that's head and shoulders above the rest of the receivers there. So you also um, look at Cooper cup though. And the reason I mean, well, he's he, mainly, he's mainly a slot guy. If I remember correctly right. with them. So, right. I mean, but we do, I, I just want to bring him up because he does warrant like notice here. These are three receivers here with a ton of potential. Um, it's just, it's kind of what we saw from the Washington last week, to be honest, you know, you got three different styles of receivers here. All three of them have a ton of talent and the ability to do significant damage against blown coverage. So, you know, I think that Cooper cup is going to end, end up drawing, Mackenzie Alexander, Trey Waynes is going to get Sammy Watkins, and Rhodes is going to get Woods. That's how I think it's going to line up. But you can mix and match here to agree to yeah. some degree as well. Right. Um, and lastly, I'm going to kind of – we had three tweets consecutively sent to us by Luke Re Re Regens. I got that last name. I, I He'll have to tell us how to pronounce it. But um, at Sil Vikes, and he sent us three tweets kind of regarding his um, stance on Teddy Keenum, and I think it's pretty good. A summation of it all so i'm just going to kind of read it off um do that in, Ke in keenum's favor teddy will need some playing time to start play at a solid level while keenum is rolling and that could cost losses the next question be becomes if teddy struggles in his first game and the vikings lose would you give him another start or how long would he play um in, ca in case your answer is yes then you have to think about um if teddy does does not play well in the next couple of games um will the other players around him keep playing well how does that affect the performance of other players the chemistry right um but in Teddy's favor, um, his ceiling is much higher than Keenum's. Starting Teddy would improve the odds of Vikings Super, of the Vikings Super Bowl, which I agree with because I just if you give a guy with a higher potential the chance, that inherently right. makes your chances higher. Right. Um, he never played on such a talented team before regarding Teddy, and so we could expect better play even after this much time off. Um, but then at the end here, he says, you know, regardless, this is a great team with great coaching. Zimmer. Um, uh, let's see. Move on to the next one here. Zimmer and Shermer are in the best position to make a wise decision. This team is a contender. It's a Super Bowl with, and fans are expecting a Super Bowl, you know, contention regardless. Um, so, um, you know, right. let's see. Moving on here. Uh, in case the Vikings, okay, the the fans will, will will want the coach to hit his hit a home run. However, if the Vikings don't win a Super Bowl, the fans will see Zimmer, Shermer, and company as wants to blame um, if they make the move to Teddy and it doesn't work out. Right. Yeah. You know. We've been making the argument over the last couple of shows that you can't go wrong to a, to a degree, but you also can't go right to a degree unless you win the Super Bowl. Because no matter what, whether it's a joke or not, if the Vikings don't win the Super Bowl this year with Case Keenum at the helm, there will be people, I absolutely will bet my life on this, one, like whatever I'm worth right now, it's not much, but I'll bet all of it, that there will be someone who says, Teddy could have taken us to the Super Bowl. Why didn't you make the switch? So, and at the same time, if if Teddy, I mean, there, there's there also going to be, be those people too that if Teddy is in the is the quarterback in the playoffs and he 
loses a game or whatever, right. they're going to say, well, he didn't play well against Seattle in the wild card game. So why How would you start you him not in this know? one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How did you not see this coming? Should have stuck with Case. Yeah, yeah, So, yeah. you know, you're, this is something that I learned very early in life, thankfully to my mother, who was, you know, as cynical, if not more so than I am. Uh, and that's that you're never going to make everyone happy. And I have lived my way, my life that way ever since because you can't make everyone happy. I don't care if you're Mike Zimmer and it's a quarterback debate or if it's your opinion on politics and you want everyone to like your opinion. There are always going to be people that just straight up say, no, I don't like that. I disagree and I hate you for it. There's always going to be those people. You can't make everyone happy. But, you know, getting to, like, I guess the context of this, you know, of this point that he's making here. You know, we mentioned it before, too, the chemistry. Uh, you know, how does a quarterback change influence the rest of the team? I think that's the the greatest unknown here, other than Teddy's, you know, potential. That's also represents an unknown here. But how much does it influence the team making a quarterback switch? Because that influences the auto- offensive line to some degree based off of how their mobility is. That influences the wide receivers in an obvious way. Tight ends, same thing. Uh, running backs, you know, you're taking handoffs in kind of a different manner just because – Every quarterback doesn't hand the ball off the exact same way. I mean, it might be a you know a, a fraction of a difference, but it is maybe a little bit different. So there's no quantifiable evidence to like to prove one that a quarterback switch is bad or good based off of chemistry yeah. until you actually see it on the field. So at the end of the day, the argument is very simple here: either you want to bring in Teddy Bridgewater and see what he's got. Or you're comfortable with Case and you're happy with what he's got and believe that can win. Those are really the two arguments here. You can break right. it down any way you want, but those are the two arguments here. Yeah, either you're comfortable with Case Keenum right now and you think this team is, is a Super Bowl contender with Case. Right. Or you think there's room for improvement at the quarterback position and you give Teddy a chance. Uh, but regardless, it looks like to me anyway, Case Keenum is going to be the guy for – more than just this week, um, and it would be it would take something like an injury or a, just a piss poor performance from Keenum for Bridgewater to take the reins. You know, uh, we'll just let, let's ma- let's kind of do an extension off of this question based off of what you just said right there. Define piss poor for me. What like how bad does he have to play See, during the I, first I, during the first thirty minutes next week against the Rams? How horrible does he have to play? Like what what? I guess it doesn't need to be statistics. What does exactly he exactly my my my? What does he it's need so to hard to measure up? this. It's so right. hard to measure. this. In your opinion, though, when would you give him the hook? What does he need to do to get the hook? If he throws two interceptions the way he did against the Washington, like those during just the first awful, half, those, yeah, if those just awful decisions, um, or um, you know, because both of those were just were just terrible. I, right. I you know terrible ideas in the first place. So if he if he makes two mistakes like that again. Um, then I think you consider it because th- those are plays right there have kind of been Keenum's, you know, Achilles heel throughout his career. And to, to this point, he has mostly avoided those. Right. Um, but if we start to see the, those trends reemerge, um, then I think you really have to mull the, the, the change at quarterback. So like you said, both those interceptions were horrible, but they are two different types of interceptions in my opinion, right? So if you remember these correctly, right, one of them, the first one was basically he lofted the ball downfield into triple coverage, dumb decision on paper, triple coverage, never do it, ever, ever, like no one, no coach is ever going to tell you that's a good idea, even if it's Calvin Johnson down there, never thrown a triple coverage. So dumb decision, decision just on paper in that way. The other one was a... You know, probably a pass that didn't have enough mustard on it and was... Well, I think that one was, was way late. Like, yeah. I think the throw was there, but it was, like, a second at least. Right, so, the decision, the, decision so the decision was, decision there... was fine, but the execution sucked. On the first one, the decision itself was horrible, and you I... could make the argument, if you like Case Keenum, you could make the argument that he's trying to attack downfield, which is... No, you, you know, can't make that argument in that play. That play. That'd be a dumb argument. But you, But people would do it. Let's be real. They right, but it would be a good argument. Right, I agree, but like it's you know, so there there are two different types of interceptions. One of them you can take away that he was being aggressive, maybe too aggressive, and you can tone that down. You can be like, "Yo, Case, check out the game situation. We can't have a pick right here. Check that down. Throw it away. Whatever." That's a that's something that you can manipulate from a mental perspective. On the second one. That was a poorly executed play that maybe a better quarterback. I'm not saying Teddy Bridgewater. I'm saying a better quarterback just in general. Sam Bradford maybe uh, gets that ball out a little bit quicker and maybe makes that 
you know, completion. Uh, so I still think that with the second one, I still think the decision to throw it after, you know, missing the window in the first place right. is a decision in itself. It's, so I, I, I see that as a problem. Probably but, just too too much, too being too aggressive relative to the game situation. I think that people wouldn't have been as pissed off about those interceptions if the Vikings were down by seven points, for example, um, because at least he would be trying, you know, he'd be in a situation where he needs to start forcing yeah. stuff to a degree. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to find some relief in that way. Uh, but for me, if Case Keenum turns the ball over twice on dumb decisions, and that's going to be subjective no matter how you look at it. Uh, but if he turns it over for holding the ball too long, for example, by throwing into a window that's already closed, if he's throwing into triple coverage again, uh, if he misses a safety, uh, tries to look off a safety, doesn't do it successfully, and the safety ends up making the pick. If you can, if you, if these type of things happen in a string during the first half, then I think you have to consider pulling him. I don't believe there's any way he gets pulled against the Rams, but if he is, a lot of bad stuff needs to happen, and I think it's going to take at least two turnovers on him. I'm not talking about like a ball that gets tipped in the air and intercepted. That's, you know, that sucks, but it's not. That's why this is so tough to like measure, right? Because, I mean, he could throw three interceptions in the first half, but they could, you know, it's possible none of them are his fault, right? you know, because that's, that's why I hate, you know, the whole Tom Brady case Keaton comparison that was flying around Twitter yesterday from ESPN. But, you know, analyzing box score stats is just a terrible idea for that reason. They compared his yards per game, his record, his TD interception ratio, whatever, to Tom Brady's first seven games as a you know starter after replacing Drew Bledsoe in 2001, and they're like identical or something. But it, it, let's stop with that. That's 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 absurd. That's dumb. Let's move on. Football fans desperately need to learn the difference between correlation and causation, which, um, you know, I thought that was something that most people lost, learned like during math class in high school. Again, I wasn't listening during math class in high school either, so I understand if some people miss that. But that's one thing. If I could teach, you know, I don't even want to say teach. If I could inspire everyone to look things, look at things more rationally from a correlation versus causation um, standpoint, uh, that would be, you know, that'd be a God's gift to earth for my Twitter mentions. So, uh, I think that about wraps up the show, though, unless we got anything else here. Uh, we got to announce that uh, the T-shirt giveaway, uh, yep. the winner of that. So why don't you go ahead and do that, and we'll wrap this thing up. Yep, the winner is going to be our friend at Gardner40Robert on Twitter. Um, so I will, we will probably send a message to him or a direct message or whatever um, the case may be. But um, we'll contact him, and we'll see you know what his favorite shirt is on the Vikings Territory Collection on Amazon. Um, stick um, with us here moving forward and we will do more of these in the, in the future, especially if you guys, um, you know, ask for them and, um, you know, get our attention with them. We'll get, we'll give more giveaways, but, um, that was our winner today is Robert at Gardner 40 Robert on Twitter. And he, um, obviously what he did though, he sent us the tweet and then he gave us a, uh, an iTunes review as well. So, um, keep giving those iTunes reviews. You'll be, um, entered into our next contest. Um, and we'll keep doing these moving forward. Absolutely. So yeah, keep an eye out for more contests. We're hoping to, we're working out some deals with our sponsors as well to get um, giveaways from them, maybe some black stack gear, some shamrocks gear, something like that. So we're trying to figure out ways to give you guys more free stuff, literally just for listening to the show. So uh, tell your friends, uh, tell your dad, why not? Right. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Uh, So thanks as always for listening. You can find us on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Google play, iHeartRadio. hit the subscribe button on YouTube. If you haven't already, Um, we'll be back later on this week with a more uh, in-depth breakdown of the Los Angeles Rams. And obviously the uh, pregame show will be on Sunday an hour before game time. So keep an eye out for that. We'll do some film review and whatnot on there. And I believe that about wraps it up. Um, Enjoy being 7-2 and two again, folks. I feel like I need to remind you this on every single episode now. Case Keenum is the quarterback. Let's all get behind him, even if you didn't want him to be there. Um, let's get a Vikings W again this weekend against the Rams. Uh, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you guys later on this week.